Welcome to the Social Media Church Podcast. I am one of your co-hosts, Aaron Magnuson, not joined today by my better half, Nils Smith, but I am joined today by two doctors, and they were quick to point out, this is the first episode we have ever had two doctors on the podcast, and if you weren't intrigued by the title, uh, you are certainly intrigued now, and I can't wait to introduce Dr. Brian and Dr. Heath to you. Uh, they did a study. And we're going to talk about this study today, and it's an academic study, and there's a lot of important caveats about this study because uh, everybody seems to be doing a study this day, uh, this day and age. But um, how many of them are actually academic versus just uh, somebody who's smart and feels entitled to write about it? Uh, no shade. But this topic is uh, done in a very particular way. This study was done in a very particular way. And we're going to talk about it on the Social Media Church podcast today because uh, in 2023, it is St. Patrick's Day today, uh, we have never been more intrigued with how evangelism, how church community, uh, how all of these conversations apply in the digital space. And Dr. Was- Brian and Dr. Heath are here to debunk every single facet of, of this based on their study. Um, I don't know who to start with. I don't know who's more of a doctor, but uh, Dr. Brian, Dr. Heath, I would love for both of you to introduce yourselves the way you would like to be introduced, not the way uh, I'm kind of poking fun, but they are both doctors. Um, mm-hmm. So we'll start with you, Brian. Do you want to introduce yourself to the the Social Media Church podcast? <laughs> well, so, hi, Brian. so I'm the one that doesn't get called doctor on a regular basis at work. <laughs> because I'm I'm a uh, over two decade veteran in youth ministry, so I really don't want my teenagers calling me doctor. There are adults at church that do that just because they know it annoys me a little bit. Um, I am a doctor though. I have graduated. Heath and I both graduated in December, um, but right now, uh, for the last ten years, I've been serving uh, as the lead student pastor at First Baptist Church in Enterprise, Alabama. Uh, we have two claims to fame. We have a statue to a bull weevil in the middle of town. A what? Uh, if you don't know what a bull a bull weevil? What is it? It is a pet. It is a pest that eats cotton plants. And there literally is a statue in the middle of town of a lady holding a bull weevil above her head. How how big is a bull weevil? Uh, it's tiny, but okay. the, the one on the statue's the size of an NFL football. Wow. So, uh, yeah, it's really interesting. Uh, it also is, uh, we're also the biggest heliport in the world. There are more helicopters in Enterprise, Alabama than there are anywhere else in the world. Really? Uh, because we train all the Air Force and Army helicopter pilots. Wow. So it's like Black Hawk down over my house every day. They just don't crash or get okay. shot down. Bull They're weevils and helicopters. Yeah. Yeah. It's a really interesting place to live. That's and great. he's laughing because he's heard all of this before. <laughs> Dr. Heath, you got to, you got to come in and, uh, you know, are you, are you more of the, the question I want to start with you? Are you more of a doctor? Uh, no, sir. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, the, the program that Brian and I went through, we were both serving in the local church when we started. And so I spent mm-hmm. uh, 17 years in pastoral ministry, serving in local churches and through the, during the process of our educational experience, I actually came on staff at Southwestern seminary in Fort Worth, Texas. And so uh, the day job, they do call me Dr. Woman more frequently and I feel very weird and not sure I like it, but, um, serve as the chief of staff, uh, for Southwestern seminary and Texas Baptist college, and also on the faculty, um, and our educational ministries. And so mm-hmm. get to talk about practical educational ministries and the implications of things like technology quite often now. And so it's, that's a, that's a fun space to be in right now. Mm-hmm. The resident expert on it. I love it. Uh, so the study that we're talking about today, I would like for both of you to introduce, and I'll, I'm going to let you guys arm wrestle this whole podcast, whoever can jump in first. Um, I, 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 we talked a little bit about it uh, before we hopped on the call, but um, maybe just set up the study you did, why the two of you did it together, uh, uh, and how you landed on the topic of study. Sure. Okay, he, I'm going to I'm gonna take the first part. You can take the end part. Go for it. So Go we're for gonna, it. We play so, nice. so I so we started this program three years ago, give or take. Um, and they tell you when you enter the doctorate of education program at Southwestern that you have uh, choice but not freedom. So neither of us 
knew as we entered into a research doctoral program that we were going to be writing on this. Uh, PhD students get to pick. We don't. Uh, they interview us. They say, hey, what do you want to write about? And then they assign you to a supervisor, and your supervisor informs you of what you're going to be writing on, um, which is exactly what happened to us and Dr. Michael Wilder who is a wonderful friend of ours now that we're done with the program. Nice. Oh, and he would agree with that. <laughs> he was a friend uh, before. He was a friend before. Uh, but now I don't, he's not putting red ink all over my stuff, all over my chapters that I write. And so Heath and I got paired up in a very odd arrangement for a research doctoral degree because we were research partners. So through the whole process, we were writing separate dissertations. Wow. Um, from two different angles about the same uh, issue, the same research topic. Huh. And for us, that was technology-mediated ministry. Essentially, how has the church used technology to engage in everyday ministry? And so I wrote on it from the uh, direction of discipleship. So you've already got people in the church. How are we discipling them? Heath wrote about it from the aspect of, hey, how are we assimilating people from outside to inside a local church? And then Heath can talk about that a little bit more. I, thank you, Brian. That, that, I'm gonna let Heath jump in, but that, for everybody listening, just in case you missed that, that, and me being a former online pastor, and Nils being a former online pastor, and the, the other co-host of this podcast, Jay Cranda, who is still an online pastor, this is the entire conversation in two facets. How are you doing discipleship digitally yep. and how are you assimilating new people into the discipleship pathway digitally? So if you didn't understand why this is an important conversation, okay. why the two doctors that did this academic study, this is really important. And if you weren't leaned in before, you should be leaned in now. Uh, Dr. Heath, take it away. Yeah, I think the... Um... The, the original topic, we didn't have the direction of discipleship, assimilation. They just wanted us in the digital space. And in fact, that was kind of how they framed it in the digital space. And the more we began to really dive in, we recognized that there's not a lot written academically. Um, we have a wealth of things in the digital space, um, articles, podcasts, et cetera, but there have not been very many genuine academic studies that dive into this in a way that's appropriate and applicable to our current season. Yes. And so the more, the more we drilled into it, we wanted to accomplish a couple of things. Yeah. We wanted to talk about assimilation and discipleship, but we wanted to draw a connection really through church history, um, to help eliminate some of the, um, anxiety that the use of technology brings to a lot of pastors still. I mean, COVID forced us all online, but there are a lot of people who did it reluctantly. And the moment they could get away from it, they're already out. And yeah. so we, we started really trying to you know, what, what is a, what is a singular idea that we could come to, to start from? And that's where the term technology mediated ministry came from. We were surprised that that term had not been coined before. And yeah. so we spent a lot of time at the very beginning, just developing that term and looking at it through the lens of church history. When you look at church history from, even if we just go back to the writings of scripture, yep. the use of, um, papyrus and, Inc., the use of the Roman road system. I mean, Paul leveraged the use of technology for the purpose of discipleship around the known world. And from that point, even prior to that, when you read the Old Testament, and you see how God worked and things that were used. I mean, the boat building technology for Noah was a big deal in his day if he was going to be obedient to the word of God, right? And so we have seen the church, if we start in the New Testament model, we've seen the church established and then utilize um, technology at every generation since. And so this idea of digital ministry is new and intimidating, but it is not the first era right. of technology. Amen. We have broadcast and radio. Say it again for the people in the back. Say it again for I, the people in the back. That's, that's, it's a big Man. deal for a lot of people because we, yeah. we think, oh my goodness, we're doing something we shouldn't do because we've, we've gone outside of yep. uh, the scope of Scripture, but yet Scripture has been advanced mm -hmm. by technology since Paul started writing, if we think about the New Testament. That's right. And do, you, so, do you have a couple more church. examples, not to put you on the spot, Heath, but do you have a couple more examples, oh. or maybe, Brian, you're excited to jump in, just, yeah. just to our audience, like, okay, get it, pen and paper, cool. Like, look, that, that's, that's yeah, scalable. So we, we, we tracked a lot of errors. So the, the written era was really predominant um, mm -hmm. into the Middle Ages, 
um, and into the area of the Reformation. And so once nope. Reformation starts um, and you've got like um, Luther's thesis tacked to the wall, um, Gutenberg's printing press comes out and all of a sudden now the things that are being handwritten is being mass produced. We, yep. Yeah, it starts trickling up um, a, a great deal. And then we get to telegraph technology, radio technology, broadcast technology. We're seeing it just it just advances and advances. And so that's why we didn't want to say we're going to be in the online church space mm -hmm. or the digital space, because that's going to be antiquated in 10 years or less. We're already talking virtual reality, metaverse, all of that stuff. And technology mediated ministry transcends it both directions historically. Yep. So we wanted something that tied it all together, wow. that that took off some of the intimidation of using technology yep. because yeah. all of a sudden we say, wait a second, I read Charles Spurgeon uh, because of technology. And just a couple of days ago, I watched Adrian Rogers preach online. That's right. Adrian Rogers, he died 18 years That's ago. Right. Yep. And so the, the utilization of technology yep. has been there. And it really helps break down some generational barriers for us. That's right. And with, chat, with chat GPT, we're going to be hearing uh, all of these pastors yep. that have yep. never, uh, ever recorded anything, yeah. audio or, or video. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's, that's, that is so important. I just like it, you need to rewind this episode three minutes and listen to all of that again. Because one thing that I have never heard, and I, I wish Nils was able to join us today. Uh, we might need to do a follow up podcast on this. Um, but I have never thought about like this was a new thought for me that the idea of online church or an online campus is soon to be, like you said, antiquated. Like that mm -hmm. has a, a, a dead end lifespan um, because there's going to be a new technology that supersedes it. And so it's more important yep. to be talking about what is true through the thread of the entire humanity. Yep. Yep. And that is this, 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 this new phrase that you've coined. Um, well, and, go ahead, Brian. and you see it too. So like, let, let's go, let's go to the cross, right? So, uh, this is something that Heath and I actually talked about after we wrote it, um, after we wrote our dissertations, but for instance, the cross is mediating technology, right? So the Romans hung people on a cross to deliver a message, That's right. to mediate a message, to say, you don't want to cross us because you will be punished yep right so however jesus flipped that on its head and mediated a different message through the cross and through the tomb to say i am the savior of the world yeah i have died for the sins and i have come back three days later that's right so so there's this idea that and this same with noah the boat was mediating technology it was to deliver a message Paul's writing, deliver a message. Yep. And and I, I actually in Heath, what's it called? What's the thing the um that we put the quote that we put at the beginning of our dissertation? What is that called? Epigraph. The epigraph. So if you read John Wesley's diary, so he kept a diary for years. Well, he talks about the interaction between he and George Whitfield. George Whitfield was huge about preaching in fields and meeting people where they were. John Wesley was not. Hmm. He thought it was sinful to not preach in a church. Well, there's this interaction recorded in the diary wow. where John Wesley, years later, comes to the realization. He says, I still love my pulpit. I still love my building. I still love my pew and the cushion in it. But who am I to say that I'm not willing to go to a field and use that field to mediate the message of the saving gospel of Christ in order to, to win one more soul to hell? Wow. And, and that's really the idea behind mediating technology is we have been given the great commission to go into all the world and make disciples. Wow. And so how are we utilizing technology in everyday ministry to do that? We've done it through the telegraph. We've done it through the radio, through TV, through the internet. And the issue I think today that we see is that because technological innovation is accelerating, yes. that that has scared people to use technology in the church. I mean, even just from the standpoint of if you're 50 or 60 and still pastoring, then are you even understanding what's coming tomorrow? 
Mm. Are you even willing to understand it? And a lot of guys have said, no, nah, man, I'm just going to keep doing things the way that I used to. Mm. Even though people in their congregation are using technology, the yeah, world is delivering. Interesting, an interesting point in that in, in our data, yeah. we need to track this down a little bit more, but we can correlate a church's receptivity to digital ministry based on the generation the senior pastor comes from. Wow. So I can I can yep. show you numerically that the older the pastor is, the less yep. the church tries to engage with technology. And so part of the part of the goal here wasn't to just argue a point as the young millennial mm -hmm. you know, Gen X guy trying to get our point across, yep. but to help them understand that this is something that the people that preceded you even did. It just looks different. Yes. And I think the biggest challenge for us and why it looks different today is because of what we're doing right now. We did not have the mm -hmm. ability to, in a synchronous fashion, interact with the radio or interact with the writings of Paul. They wrote a letter and responded, but there's a delay. We wrote in on the radio station, but there was yep. a delay. We called in on the broadcast at the end of the message to talk to a counselor, but there's a delay. We get to engage with the material and the content in a live synchronous way. And I think that is, that's the, that's the pinnacle shift that we're seeing in the digital era yep. is that we get to do the things that we're doing right now. And that's, what's intimidating to the church. If it was just broadcast live stream that I can go watch on Facebook or um, yeah, YouTube, yeah. Yes. it would be no different than the broadcast era, right? That's and so right. the the intimidation factor for many of our church leaders is, well, what do I do when they talk back? Because they're not used to that. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's one of the things that we've tried to really navigate here. And it's one of the things that we think we can leverage. You know, the greatest, yep. the greatest wins that we're seeing, especially on a church growth side, is this idea of engagement and evangelism. Um, you could share a message in previous methods of technology, but you couldn't have a dialogue. And you need a dialogue to engage with people meaningfully. You need a dialogue to evangelize effectively. And yes. so we can do those things in a way that has never been done before in areas and regions of the world that is still hostile to the gospel, That's but right. yet technology gives us a, a entrance into somebody's living room that we would never physically yep. be able to walk in. That's exactly and so right. the... the the church growth piece, though there's some questions about, you know, should I, admit, should I let somebody be a church member if they've never walked through the front door? What does that <laughs> look like? I mean, there's there's challenge there. And in fact, part of the part of the research in that, it, it, it we give a pretty big caution saying that for churches that are going as far as saying, well, we're going to have an iCampus that actually lets people be meaningful church members um, from different places, we're, we're statistically showing that the more you do that, the less you have accountability. And so yeah. the church is there, there. We're sacrificing church accountability by just going all in in membership. And so some people are saying, well, I'm not going to do it at all. And we miss the value of the evangelism and the engagement that we can have um, and to be able to utilize things. I mean, churches right now, we're talking yep. about money and how you're funding this. This yeah. idea of personnel, equipment, and content creation, right? Those are those are the three yep. big pieces. and. We've, we've reluctantly given staff, we recognize we need some type of equipment to do digital ministry or technology yep. at all, but this idea of content creation, I'm getting to think about ways to create new innovative content that just doesn't get thrown online for somebody to watch later, but that I can actually interact with people in perpetuity. Like I, I can use That's this right. forever and let it evolve, let it adapt, and let it be live engagement as we're reaching people because... I mean, they said for a long time, our website's the front door of the church. Yeah. And even more than that, in this generation, people aren't going to the church website. They're engaging with us in the eight second reels that they're seeing on social media. Yes. And so, yeah. I mean, another stat in our research, the attention span of this generation is 12 seconds. And social media has caused that because of our ability yeah. just to, to push through. And so we Crazy. need to find ways to create meaningful content that engages people yes. quick. And That's then right. leverage that for the purpose of evangelism. And That's so right. there, and there's we've been really talking on this podcast all year, Heath, yep. about no, short I, I form it. vertical video, yep. right? Short form vertical video. And it's exactly. not it's not a substitution, it's an addition. It's yep. it's another pulpit, it's another piece of content, it's another field to go preach in. I think about the the fear piece that you talked about and what instantly popped into my head, how fearful people must have been when the printing press put uh, the ability to read the Bible into everybody's hands. How people much were, were those... at the stake over that? 
Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like what, what's, what's the role of me as a pastor reading this, this book anymore? Everybody has it. What, what, what do I have? Right. That, that's not, uh, that's not an accurate playing out of how that happened. And, and, and it's also not an accurate playing out of what am I going to do with this new technology? They don't need me. Why are we creating all it? No, we need, it's a both. And uh, right. it's not a substitution. Well, and, and I think one of the things for us too, is in what we did research, it was, there was a desire to inform guys, inform people, pastors that are leading churches. Okay. How do you staff? How do you structure? Yeah, How yeah. do you resource? Because even guys that understand technology, that are relatively technology savvy as a person, as an individual, still have no idea how to do that in the church. And that's borne out in the research. Like, for instance, the people that I interviewed, um, I had uh, communication pastors. I had online pastors. Mm -hmm. I had... Uh, executive pastors, church administrators. I had creative pastors. Yep. I had uh, digital ministries pastors, and I had a senior pastor. And so, and every one of them, it was really interesting to say, okay, what are you exactly in charge of? Because every church is staffing, resourcing, and structuring their technology mediated ministry differently. Yes. And measuring. And I'm not saying, and measuring, and measuring it, and measuring it differently. And so that's part of the reason, and, and I want to throw this out there. We've talked about the study a little bit about it being academic, right? Yeah. So what we did was we took Outreach Magazine's fastest growing church list okay. from 2021, right? He, yeah, so 2021, they reproduced their 19 and 20 list and included online viewership because it was during the COVID era. Okay. So these are the fastest Got growing yep. churches during COVID. And so if there was an online element there, right. they weren't. Right. And so what we did was we surveyed them. We got participants out of that that filled our phase one quantitative survey out, which means we were looking to get numbers and percentages and short answers out of that. Um, and then what we did was Heath and I both chose a, uh, a group of 10 churches to interview their staff member that was in charge of technology mediated ministry. And so we got qualitative data from that. And the important thing is for most churches, when you measure, a lot of churches are leaning really heavy to the quantitative side. Like they're like, Hey, we want to see how many people are watching, how many people yep. interacting with this content. But yep. what churches are struggling to do is to measure qualitatively, yes. meaning stories of, of life change, yep. you know, and, and the, 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 the interesting thing about that is, is because, um, the instantaneous, the synchronous, uh, nature of technology today, you can get stories of life change instantaneously. Yes. And churches aren't using that. That's yeah. like, they're not celebrating that. And you know, in church world, what you don't celebrate is not is not going to continue to grow. Yep. Yep. And so I think a lot of people that are very hesitant to engage in technology mediated ministry, it's because they're not hearing stories of how technology is an yes. integral part of how we're carrying out everyday ministry, both yep. ministry online and ministry in person. Yeah, spiritual yep. formation, because, life discipleship, that's more than just numbers on a page, right? And I mean, you think about local church world, going back 20 years, what did we have? We right. had the little Sunday school scorecard, right? I showed up, I brought my offering, I brought yep. my Bible, I invited a friend. And so we're, we're, we have historically been tied to the, the numbers and the statistics part. Yep. But the local church, even in the churches that we studied, um, and we, we, we did a deep dive with 20 different churches on the fastest growing churches oh, in yeah. America list. And all of those leaders identified two areas of importance when they're trying to get metrics, statistics yep. and stories. But yep. yet when you ask them what they're measuring, they're only measuring statistics. That's right. 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 We recognize statistics and stories are important and they're going to help drive this forward. But I, I, I know how many people viewed on social media. I know how many likes we got on our page. I know um, how much money came in through online giving, right? Mm -hmm. Those are the metrics. 
but yet there's no meaningful method for us to measure the the qualitative aspects here. And so that's the piece. I mean, we we have hired a generation of online church and communication pastors, um, and then we've we've strapped them to you need to produce right. and show us the numbers, that's but right. yet they don't have the meaningful engagement with individuals. And part of that's because the church was not meant to be done in isolation and over a screen, right? And so we are going to be limited, but there are people who are hindered by life and location. Yes. And that could be a variety of things. That could be ailment, that could be yep. service in the military, that could be a variety of different reasons why we're hindered by life and location. But there are there are qualitative stories that can come out of engaging with these people and evangelizing these people. I had one church that said that they 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 accept the information but yet if it didn't translate into what was happening in their church they didn't count it. I'm like, "Well, what happens when I evangelize somebody in Africa over the internet?" Mm. Well, we just yep. we chalk that up as an eternal win, but we don't count. No, we need to celebrate that. That may not be yeah. a numeric story that we give yeah. in our, you know, annual church report of how much money came in. But by God, that needs to be a video on the screen where we're celebrating somebody who came to faith in a yeah. third world country because we use technology and our church people invested in that in a way that we would not have ever been able to see outside of this. Uh, and so, all right. yeah, Brian's right. The stories are so important and we're missing that mark a lot. Yep. And, and I'm going to throw this out there. So I'm going to make an assumption. I don't think it's a huge leap that everybody watching this has some type of church management software. You've got a CMS that you're using. Mm -hmm. I, I guarantee and if you don't, you, let's talk. We got to talk. Yeah, we're we're going to yes. need to have a conversation real fast. So, for you. Let, me, yeah. let me tell you, that is, one of, that is one of the biggest ways that you can engage in technology-mediated ministry mm -hmm. is just having a CMS, right? And there's a lot of churches that would say, well, yeah, I'm not engaged in technology-mediated ministry, but they have a CMS. That's right. And you look at them and say, "Yes, you are." However, I'm 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 drifting now. He knows I chase rabbits. Oh, the student pastor. Really can't. Oh, it, yeah. it is, man. I, I see a rabbit. I want to chase it. Maybe the ADHD. Who knows? Um, but here's the deal. How many of your CMSs have a notes section hmm. or an interaction section yeah. where you can go in and type notes about each person in your church? Mm-hmm. And, and my question is, how many of you have never utilized that? And, and my guess is those that have it are the people that are focused on the quantitative, the numbers side, yep. and not focused at all on the qualitative, the story side. That's right. Because if you're not using the notes, if you're not keeping like a, a, an updated say, hey, you know, this person engaged with us online this day. This person showed up to church for the first time this day. Yep. This person accepted Christ this day. This person entered the discipleship pathway, the discipleship pipeline, whatever it is this day. See, that is, those are, that's a qualitative story. Yes. Even though it's based on dates, that tells a qualitative story of how that person has engaged with the church, been assimilated into the church, met and found Christ, and then was discipled. Yes. Uh -huh. Yep. That's right. That's, that's exactly right. But that takes a lot of work and uh, who's going to do that and who's going to like, w are we going to, you know, use, and w I'm going to put air quotes for those of you listening, waste our resources on right. somebody mm -hmm. updating the notes section of X, Y, and Z. Cause are we chasing stories or did we get a thousand views times 2.5? Mm -hmm. Cause there was probably a couple people I'm winking uh, at everybody on the screen. Cause there's a couple people. <laughs> so, um, Multipliers, right? All this stuff. I should have started with this at the top, and um, we're we're gonna. This will be a longer podcast episode because uh, <laughs> Brian and Heath have brought the energy today, and this is exciting. Um, but how many people were interviewed? We, I should have done this at, like at the top. Like, how many people do you guys have numbers on? Like, how many people participated in the survey? Kind of what what the scope is, so that as we're hearing sure. some of so, this data that we're about to talk about, we have yeah. context. Yes. Outreach 100, their list is 100 churches every year. The unique part about our list is because they republished 19 and 20. Because of some overlap, it wasn't a true 200. There are 154 churches that we started with. These are churches that it's interdenominational. It's not tribal in any way. It's multi-regional. Mm -hmm. We had churches literally from every coast, northern region, all the way down to the, the Texas-Mexico border. Like it, 
We transcended mm-hmm. the country, um, and we sent our first phase survey to everybody. Um, and so it was voluntary, so not everybody participated. But in that, we were able to find exemplars of people who at least said, we're doing discipleship well, and we're doing engagement or assimilation well. And mm-hmm. so that was the, that's how we got down to the list of 10, uh, because, I mean, we, there's only so much of us, right? So we, we jumped in with the exemplars um, and had our, we had backup lists, et cetera. And so there were yep. some people that didn't do it. So we were able to rotate in. Um, the, the survey um, actually had markers already measured into the study. So we didn't just go randomly pick. Um, their, nope. their responses in phase one triggered their ability to be in yeah, phase you know. two. And so it, it, it distilled that down for us. We were trying to be very methodical in how we did this because we wanted it to be legitimate. Yep. And so yep. once, right. once we got to the end, Brian and our research overlapped in phase one. It was a multi-phased mixed methods empirical study is what we did. If anybody cares what it's called, which is, it's which more, is a mouthful. Some yeah. people care about it. <laughs> Some people yeah. care about it. The, the phase one, the numeric part, phase one, we shared. And so the original instrument that we sent out to the entire group, it had questions that leaned both areas. And we talked about yeah, kind yeah. of the key places of measurement and strategic initiative and the things that they're doing, key things that we looked at that touched both of our topics. We shared that data, find, found our exemplars, and then we went to a phase two qualitative study where Brian did a deep dive with the discipleship people. I did a deep dive with the assimilation people. And then we used our executive summary, which is the document that, that you got, that we'd be happy to um, let people see that if they want to reach out to us um, at Heath Woolman all social media handles, and you can connect me with me on the uh, seminary website, uh, swbts.edu. Just look for the faculty page. You'll see me there. But the All that's in the show notes, by the way, and you want this survey, guaranteed. You want it, so reach out. We'll share that with you. We try to do it as kind of a um, a good view book, so there's not a lot of words. There's a lot of graphs, Um, but uh, we took our data and came brought it back together, and so we found common trends between both, especially numerically. But then we recognized where the priorities were um, with churches that are trying to engage with people versus churches that are trying to disciple people versus churches that are trying to do all of it at the same time. And if they aren't resourcing that well um, and they're not prioritizing the resources that they have to do those things, uh, we're not seeing a lot of effectiveness here. And so you ask the question, who's going to do that? It's the churches that are going to be intentional about, like I said, those three things, personnel, um, equipment and content creation, right? If we're not staffing it well, if we're not giving the resources we need, and if we're not being innovative in the space, we're really not going to see the returns that the church wants us to see like we were it with people who walk in the front door. That's so good. Uh, Heath and Brian, as we, I mean, we could easily spend hours here. Um, and so we we (laughs) have, we have, uh, you guys have, um, uh, this conversation downloading it, uh, what I, what I'm thinking in this moment, probably to, to pique people's interest, I would say, uh, I want to hear from each of you in those two different areas, the discipleship piece, and then the assimilation piece from you, Heath. Um, what is, what is something that you would say to entice someone that they're going to want to see all of the data? Like maybe it's an interesting thing that you found, an interesting correlation uh, that maybe something unexpected um, that intrigued you to look at X, Y, and Z. Because I really want people to reach out. I want them to download this. And then I know that after Nils listens to this podcast, yes, Nils and I listen to each other's podcast when we're not on it. Um uh, I know that there's going to be a follow-up conversation to where Nils is probably going to want to ask a lot of questions as well. So as we wrap, we're going to say version one of this conversation. There will be another version. Uh, I would be curious to hear from you guys, uh, each in the respective areas, again, the discipleship piece and the assimilation piece, something that is going to intrigue the listeners right now to reach out and say, I got to see the rest of that data. Brian, go. Uh, go, Brian. I, 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 it's a two-part it's okay. two things. I'm gonna let so you go. I pro- Just because I'm feeling propose- generous today, I'm gonna let you go, Brian. <laughs> I uh, I propose a discipleship pathway for both areas, six specific areas that you need to measure quantitatively and qualitatively. So walking through, and this is coming from the churches that I interviewed and piecing together. So not all these churches measure all six of these areas okay. well. Uh, or at all. 
So I give you six mile posts to measure. Um, I, I think the, the interesting thing too, in relation to that is how are churches using data to measure these things and where is that data coming from? So, uh, I, I was very surprised at where some of their, um, uh, where some of their data was coming from. You got to give one example, at least one example. I have no so, idea what you're going to say, but I, I cannot I, wait. So, um, it was interesting that there were a few churches that were utilizing marketplace, uh, customer data portals in the church hmm. to harvest data, both for assimilation and for discipleship. Wow. Yeah. It, it was a shock to me as well. So, so, so un unpack that a little bit. Uh, so that, that people, people have content for maybe people that don't, aren't, aren't as in the weeds on data. Um, what, what exactly does that mean? So, so for instance, you put out a piece of content aimed at discipling family or the parents specifically, a dis piece of discipleship content aimed at parents that have five to eight year olds. Okay. And you use this customer data right from marketplace sources okay. to show you how old the parent, the people are that are interacting with that data, where are they located, how old are their kids? Because you can get a lot of that data online. Yes. That, that use of big data information to show you if your discipleship content pieces are actually reaching the pe people that you want them to reach. Wow. Or if it's just that sweet, senior old lady who's watching everything that the church does that, because you know correct doors are kind of set on a pew virtually right so you know and pairing that with digital resource opt-in where someone inside your church has to put an email address or a phone number in so that you know who it is but like connecting those two things gives you a lot more quantitative data and then gives you someone to follow up for qualitative data. That's right. Hey, how has that resource helped you? Did it even help you at all? That's right. And then innovating on top of that. And and Correct. what what you're what you're alluding to, Brian, is this is resources spent because that data is not free. The the church no. the church paid a marketplace. Look and, and and by the way, we're not alluding to something shady happening here, but there no. was there was there was resources invested in doing yeah, a yeah. deep dive, was our digital discipleship effective? And maybe yes, maybe some parts no. Uh, and then we build on that uh, to do a version two, version three, mm -hmm. to become yep. effective at digitally discipling. Uh, yeah, okay, you, yeah. you got to check out the data. I mean, I'm, in, I'm intrigued. Um, Brian, you sold me, especially the, the, the six framework, uh, the, mm -hmm. the six kind of marker framework. Um, I'm, I'm even wondering about how we can create a resource, but anyways, uh, <laughs> may have to offline about that Heath from your side, the assimilation side, and probably, I think the discipleship piece, in my opinion, more important, the assimilation piece, I think gets all the press. Uh, and so I think if you're a listener, you should be figuring out how you should do discipleship better. Cause that's that, that's really where that qualitative data sits. It's easier sure. for us to get distracted on the assimilation piece. We had a million people watching divided by 200, uh, right. So you got to sure. figure it out. Why is your so video that's, only that's, have two views? Um, yeah. anyways. Okay. The, so the assimilation uh, piece, Heath, let's bring some clarity yeah, here. That's, and, that's, and that's in the assimilation piece that I think is really helpful. Um, it's not necessarily prescribing, right? So we're, we're going to help you. Uh, build a discipleship process, right? That's going to be more prescriptive. For us on the assimilation piece, we're we're trying to regularly self-evaluate to make sure that we're, one, being relevant, two, being effective, three, being biblical. I guess I should have put that in reverse order, right? We need to be biblical, <laughs> effective, and relevant. But at the same time, you know, Brian had six, I had six also. Churches identified six areas that they try to measure with regard to their engagement. And of those, we say these are the, these are the things that matter to us, but yet... Only 20% of the churches that we talk to actually measure yeah, it well. Mm -hmm. And of those who are measuring it, there is very little consistency across those areas. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's easy to count butts in a pew. But as yeah. soon as we start talking digital space and we look at these different areas, 
man, we talk about multipliers. I had churches saying, well, we were using the standard multiplier. Well, I asked them what that was, and I had a range from zero to 3.04. And so, and, and 20 options in between there, right? Because nobody really uses the same multiplier. We can get an average out of that. But we ask yep. a question, you know, about the validity of multipliers. Uh, there's some data going out right now, resources that are going out and saying, listen, we just need to abandon the multiplier conversation because what that's doing is that's forcing us to be more number driven anyway when we're yep. really trying to become more holistic and be qualitative story driven. And so I don't care necessarily how many people are in the room while you're watching. I want to know about life change that's happening in that room. And that could be two people. It could be four people. I care less about the number as much as I do about the the whole life aspect of what we're trying to do. Yep. And so assimilation isn't just getting people in the pipeline, but it's really, when you look at it and you look at Brian's um, pathway that he's going to, he's going to be able to share. Assimilation is really the first step of the discipleship process. That's right. Um, yeah, it's, yeah. it's the top of the funnel, if you will. Yep. And, and so we need to widen that as broadly as we can, but we don't know how to widen it if we're not effectively measuring ourselves. Um, and knowing what to measure and what's important. And so uh, recognizing that only 20% of the churches that are doing it, the other piece, we see we have a high view of church accountability, right? We're going to bring people in, we're going to hold them accountable, we're going to help them grow. Over 83% of the churches said that, yeah, we have a high view of accountability. But the deeper they go into technology, they begin to abandon that accountability, yes. and only about 20% of them are actually doing it once they're all in in technology. And so we've got we've got to bridge that gap somewhere and say, yeah, we're all in on the important things of what being a church means. But once we fully engage with people, we've still got to be doing those things. And right now we're giving it up. We're, we're, we're sacrificing the meaningful aspects of church membership and being a part of a local body by just throwing stuff online and hoping that the numbers go mm -hmm. up and people give. And yep. we got to get past multipliers and giving totals. If we want this to be something that is not just relevant culturally, but relevant eternally. Man, what else is there to say? Uh, that was a great summation. Um, and I think everybody who's listening to this should absolutely uh, dive into this study and figure this out because yeah, it, it has eternal ramifications, um, <clears throat> not just in the, in the spiritual sense of eternity, but in the sense of the, this trajectory of technology continuing to advance and if this study can help us at all prepare for the next two decades where well, I don't even know what it's going to look like, but if it can give us that confidence that Paul writing letters can give us, uh, we would want this to be one of those milestones in this trajectory of God continuing to use the advancement of technology um, to advance the gospel, uh, to see lives changed and uh, to get all of those stories. Uh, Brian Heath, Thank you so much for your time. Um, I I got to ask this question. It came up, it came into my head uh, at the beginning of this conversation. There was something I think that either one of you said, I don't remember. Um, but in this study, and this is as an online pastor, this is something I always wondered. Uh, when Jesus left and he left us his Holy Spirit, that was an act of um, scalability, right? Jesus said, it is going to be better for me to leave and to give you the Holy Spirit, that's scale. Jesus made the church scalable at that point. <clears throat> and if you continue to play that out, more and more scalability, you get into online, you get to right. And so the question that I always was wondering, and it's more of a fun question, I don't know that, it, you know, some people might think it has theological ramifications, but um, it, the perfect scalability would mean like the elimination of proximity. And so my question to the both of you that I would always wrestle through is how much, especially because this we're, we're connected spiritually, right? We don't understand that, but we, we, we feel it. How much does proximity matter? And, and based on going through this study, how would you answer the question of how much does proximity matter? So uh, we are eternal beings fixed in a body that God has created us to be communal. And I think we would be very careful to recognize that community is not always based on proximity, but community in the way that we were created as individuals, proximity does matter. When you look at Paul's writings, he's leveraging technology to the various churches, but you don't have Philippians in the church of Corinth. You have Philippians making up the Church of Philippi. You have Corinthians making up mm. the Church of Corinth. And so you see this understanding that there's 
There is technology mediation happening to disciple, to encourage, to equip, to send out these people, but yet there's still an aspect of understanding what it means to be a, a local body of believers who are joined together by conviction and proximity. And so part of this study is not right. to, in fact, this study was not intended at all right. to right. abandon the local church. In fact, yep. Brian writes on it more than I do, but we, we want to advocate more for this understanding of a hybrid understanding of how technology right. can both be used in the local embodied body of believers, but can be leveraged for the other six and a half days that people aren't in the building. And in that, we to engage in, people- To in enhance life. day seven, to enhance uh, day seven, yep. To enhance day seven and to engage with people in a space that may, they may never be able to walk in the door. Um, and so here's my, here's my shameless plug for those of you who are interested in doing academic studies. This was the first step in technology-mediated ministry. We need people Amen. to come in and take some of this data and work towards, what does this look like in community groups? What does this look like missionally, right? We're talking about engagement, but we need to talk about sending. Yep. And so Brian and I both have in, in our actual dissertations, there's an entire section of recommended research for people to be able to pick this up and run with it to another area. Um, and so we're, we're doing assimilation and discipleship. Amen. We need to be talking about missions. We need to be talking about small groups. We need to talk about worship <laughs> and what that looks like. I mean, there's an entire generation <laughs> of worship pastors that need to understand biblical yeah, yeah, principles yeah. and how to leverage technology without abandoning our convictions. Well, and and I want to throw this in too. Now, I actually put AI in my further research section. So, Never. Never. And, and that was four months ago. So um, I, I will say this though, in in our study, we, we uh, quantitative and qualitatively talked to a wide variety of churches. Churches yep. that came from a wide variety of ecclesiological background. If you don't know what ecclesiological means, it means how are you doing church structure? You know, so we had churches that were one campus. We we really don't focus on technology. We had churches that were multi-campus that were all regional, like their campuses were regional. Uh, we had churches that were multi-campus, but their campuses are all over the United States and even all over the world. Uh, we had churches that, hey, we have an online campus that's just online, and we have a physical campus. So when we talk, yes, we went and did our study at Southwestern, which is a Southern Baptist seminary. Both Eth and I are both Southern Baptists, but there was no preconceived notion about what that looks like. However, uh, as he's talking about, I did write all, a great deal about the hybrid experience. And there is something to be said for when Jesus says, when two or three gather, there I will be also. So there is this idea of a needed physical gathering. However, that's not the end either. Like, that's not the only thing that we need to do. You know, if people are only showing up on Sunday morning and they are not engaging in spiritual formation at the rest of the week, then how good is that? You know, I mean, what does that look like in a person's life? I mean, because I actually, my my two boys go to school more than they go to church. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, like, for real. Yep. And I have a nine-year-old and a 13-year-old. So, like, we're being formed by the world. Like, technology is mediating messages every day when we interact with it. So, isn't it better for that for those pieces of technology to be mediating a message of hope in Christ of being formed into the image of Christ you know 6.8% like 6.8 days out of the week yep to help drive those people to say hey I want to meet physically with my small group to discuss <laughs> what I've been learning hey I want to meet physically with my church to to worship him yep and so that's really where we land is that it's a both and yep it's not an either or beautiful love it brian heath thank you so much for your time uh and your energy i uh I, have you guys done a podcast on this anywhere else so we we have co-lectured virtually um for southwestern Ooh. seminary uh, okay so it was that, that, that's a new piece even for the seminary to have uh, virtual online lectures. And so we're, 
we're mediating technology even on the academic space, trying to Love it. trying to give an example of the stuff that we're talking about here. So yeah, this is this has been a fun topic to get to chase down for a while. We're doing some we're doing some writing as well. Brian just did a good article on uh, techno uh, the theology of technology and student ministry um, wow. for a online journal. Um, we're doing some stuff for the Land Center for Cultural Engagement. Um, Nine yep. marks. We're doing some stuff for some other journals academically. Um, and so we're, we're excited about this being one of the first steps. In fact, the first time outside of the academy that we've actually talked about technology, media, and ministry as a concept. Um, okay. And so you heard, heard it here first, right? So. <laughs> yep. that's, what I was, that's what I was trying to get at least one of the doctors yeah. on the call to say. Uh, <laughs> we've set all, kind of, all kinds of records here today. And um, Brian, did, did you have one more thing you wanted to share? I, on that? I would say like there's nowhere else we would rather do it because you helped us out with our dissertation. So there you go. You, uh, you know, yeah. Yeah. So um, then props to the social media podcast. We had um, our data was not just Heath and Brian doing it together. We had expert field testers and expert panelists. And so um, Aaron helped us in the field testing. And so looking at our stuff, making sure it works, making sure yeah. that our instrumentation is effective. Jay Cronda actually was one of our expert panelists. And so he's helping us think through the questions we're asking. Yep. Um, and so your all's team, I mean, y'all were on both ends mm -hmm. of the preparation and implementation um, of our study. So we wouldn't, we wouldn't want to have this conversation anywhere else first. No. Well, on behalf of our audience, uh, we're honored to have you here. And, uh, on behalf of Nils and I honored to interview you. Thank you for all the work that you put in to do this. This is, this is kingdom work. Uh, and this is important work as we go into 2023 and beyond and try to figure this out. And, um, I'll end by saying, Brian and, and Heath, where would be, all this is in the show notes, but I want them to hear it from you. We've alluded to it throughout the podcast. Best place, I'm going to say, I'm going to let you guys say one each. Uh, best place, Brian, that you want someone to reach out to you? Uh, DM me on Twitter, yeah. Brian Um Not Brian spelled the right way with a Y, not an I. There you go. And now you go. I just got a bunch of hate for that. But that's, that's okay. okay. You, you now you know his Twitter handle. You can let him know about it instantaneously as yes. you're listening to this. Uh, and please do that. Reach out on Twitter. I love that you said Twitter, by the way. Uh, are you verified on on Twitter? I am not. Okay, I'm not either. That's okay. Uh, Elon yeah. hasn't given me the blue check. I also haven't paid Elon no. the blue check. So, um, uh, no. okay, <laughs> Heath, where is the best place for people to connect with you? So quickly at Heath Woolman on every social media network. So you can connect with me there. And um, my information about the seminary contact will be in the, in the show notes as well. Perfect. Uh, because this is a social media church podcast. Where, where is your favorite social media, Heath? Uh, Instagram. Okay. Instagram, Instagram guy. And we got a Twitter guy. Perfect. I'm also a Twitter guy. So um, <clears throat> Twitter wins on this episode. Anyways, mm -hmm. uh, for all of <laughs> for all of you that endured, <laughs> Uh, and listen and, and, and waited through this uh, conversation with us. We appreciate your listening ear. Uh, if you would be so kind as to subscribe to this podcast, uh, you're going to help other leaders that are searching for how to do church online and social media church uh, encounter our, our content. And if you would uh, like to leave a review, stories matter. And you heard that here first from both Dr. Brian and Dr. Heath. Uh, we want to hear how this podcast has impacted you. So also leave a review. Uh, we didn't talk about it a ton at, actually at all, but it's important to note, uh, Aaron and Nils don't do anything in the production of this podcast. We just record it, hit stop recording. We send it over to our team at Amplify, which is who produces this podcast. We are so grateful for our team at Amplify. And uh, if you want to check out uh, our team and how they might be able to help you, you can go to AmplifySocial.media. And for all other episodes, you're probably listening to uh, this on a podcast network that you uh, listen to all your podcasts on. You can find us there. You can also go to socialmedia.com church. We will catch you on the next episode and stay tuned because we're going to have another episode here with Brian and Heath. Nils will be in here. We're excited. Thank you, Brian and Heath for joining us. We'll talk soon, everybody. Aaron, thank you. Thank you.